I like to uh, continue on with a series of um, critical thinking and continue where we left off. Um, if um, if everyone who's on the call, if you could um, share your video. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, and um, always feel free to unmute yourself and ask any any questions that you might have. Um, so, critical thinking two, and I like to. Um, say more about the difference between deductive and inductive thinking, talk more about when, uh, well, the last time we talked about whether uh, a phrase or a statement was actually an argument or just merely a statement of fact, we're going to deal more about, uh, about the building blocks of especially in the inductive arguments. So um, why don't we look at this slide and look at the three statements and identify the premises and conclusion in all, all, all of these statements are, are arguments. So why don't you use your annotation tool I take it you're able to use your annotation tool, and why don't we go into the the first one, which um, which is the uh, premise uh, denoted by P and C for conclusion. Which is the conclusion in this first statement? Yes. <clears throat> Shall we talk about the first one or the second one? No, well, no, the, the first one. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's go in order. The first one. The, the, first, the first one, the first sentence is premise, and the second sentence is conclusion. Okay. Well, again, try to use your annotation tool, so in case. Oh, okay. So which is the premise? Uh, the first sentence. Okay. And the, uh, obviously the second one is the conclusion. Uh, yeah. Everyone agree? I cannot see my pen here. What's that? I can see uh, the annotations. I can use the pen. Are you... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, what did you say, Golana? I uh, I cannot see these find these pen and uh, markers to ah uh, okay now I can find it yes okay uh, convince me that it's working why don't you okay. just annotate something oh okay all right you, you, okay very good all right so what about the second sentence uh, sentence. So you're saying this is the premise? No, this is the conclusion. The conclusion. Yeah, the conclusion. conclusion. The okay. clunk comes only. Wait, you're saying this is the conclusion? Mm. Help me out here. Let me let me clean this up. So which is the premise? I think the first is the premise. The first is the premise. And the second, the conclusion. Okay, what do people think about that? No, I think the first one is conclusion and second one is premise. Okay, we have a difference of opinion here. What? What is? One trying to convince one of what? What's the, what am I trying to convince somebody? Or what is the narrator trying to convince? Uh, 
I think the narrator is trying to convince somebody of what the problem must be, right? It's a problem must yeah. be. That's, that's the convincing sentence. So that's the conclusion. And they derived a conclusion from the fact that, hmm, only when I pedal, I have a clunk. So the problem must be either in the chain, the crank, or the pedals. Mm. Okay. All right. What about this? Which is the what? What? What am I trying to convince somebody of? That dogs are smarter than cats. Okay. What? What do people think about that? Well, the um, so actually, one one could actually state that both of these sentences are claims, right? Mm -hmm. Dogs are smarter smarter than cats, and it's easier to train dogs. Those are both claims, okay? But which which claim supports the other claim? Think of it that way now. I think using sense would support that it's easier to train is the premise. Right, yes. So this, this claim serves as a premise or as evidence as why Dogs are smarter than cats. And, right, the giveaway is the word since. Since. Here you don't have any giveaway words. But usually since it goes before a premise. And words like therefore uh, goes is an indicator of a of a claim. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I guess you have to Let's see if that keeps. Let's see. Oh yeah, you guys have to you have to erase your annotation. Clear your annotation from my slides. Yeah, yeah. Look for the trash can. Okay, very good. We're getting there. Okay, we still have a little bit of a mess here. I don't think. can't get rid of that and all these words here all right who wrote these words somebody is responsible for that <laughs> Look for the trash can. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. I keep hearing okay, but. Uh, it takes and okay, and how it goes to this trash can. Are you clicking on the trash can? 
Yes. <sighs> Unless it's somebody else. I deleted mine. I could, I could control it all. All right, very good. Okay, good. So, um, so again, conclusions as premises. Um, so, in this example, uh, we have the brakes aren't working. The engine bo burns oil. The Transmission needs work, and the car is hard to start. So, uh, actually, there's these premises actually serves for two conclusion: the car has outlived its usefulness, and we should get a new car. So, actually, uh, the um, actually. This conclusion serves as a premise for this conclusion. Um, so, as we saw in the previous example, premises are also conclusions, and they need to sometimes be supported by supporting evidence. Hopefully, the um, the premise. Uh, well, here the premise is backed up by these premises, and this conclusion now serves as a premise for this new conclusion. The idea is what is the relationships between uh, all all these statements. Um, another complication is that um, arguments can contain unstated premises. So in this example, the premise is you can't check out books from the library without an ID. And the conclusion is Bill won't be able to check out any books. So what's the missing premise? That Bill doesn't have an ID. Yes, right, exactly. Very good. Bill doesn't have an ID. Okay, very good. So, and, uh, let me. Happening. Just trying to get the slides to work. All right. Can't remember what I did for the next time. Okay. All right. Now, so again, there's two types of arguments. There's deductive and inductive. A deductive argument Both types of arguments have premises and conclusions. Now, in a uh, deductive argument, we say that the premises, if the both premises are true, 
proves absolutely the conclusion. So, and when that happens, we say an argument is said to be valid if it isn't possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion falls. In other words, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. So in this statement here, Jimmy Carter was president immediately before Bill Clinton and George Bush was president immediately after Bill Clinton. And hence the conclusion, Jimmy Carter was president before George Bush. If these two premises are true, this statement is definitely true, absolutely true. You can't, you can't say that's false because you know, you know these premises are true. And hence, I mean, um, we're not, as we'll see, we're not inducing anything. We're not infer inferring from anything. Um, when, God, when we take care of patients, we, we actually think inductively. We try to get all the facts, all the evidence, and make our best guess. Uh, as to what illness the patient has based on all the symptoms and signs. Are we 100% sure? No. Okay. Uh, but in a deductive argument, if these premises are true, and these premises are true, then this statement has to be true as well. All right. So... Um, I don't know what's happening. Let me just um, I guess I have to. All right. So sound arguments. Now, when the premises of a valid argument is true, we say the argument is sound. So here's an argument, uh, here's an example of a sound argument. Bill Clinton is taller than George Bush and Jimmy Carter is shorter than George Bush. Therefore, Bill Clinton is taller than Jimmy Carter. Um, the argument is sound because it's valid and the premises are true. Um, so let me, um, that may sound unconvincing, so let me give you this example here. So this is an example from Abe Lincoln. Uh, before he became president, he had these debates with uh, William Douglas. And uh, uh, Douglas said the following, nothing in the US Constitution can destroy a right that's distinctly and expressly affirmed in the Constitution. The right of property of a slave is distinctly and expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Therefore, nothing in the Constitution can destroy the right of property in a slave. Okay? So, this deductive argument is valid. All right? Because... If you have th this premise and this premise, this has to be true. It's a, 
It's a valid argument. However, Lincoln said, there's a fault in the argument, but the fault is not in the reasoning, meaning it's not in the structure of the argument. The fault is in the premise. And he says, the right of property in the slave is not distinctly expressed in the Constitution. So this is not a sound argument because one of the premises is false. If both premises were true, then you can deductively conclude that this is correct. If the premises were true, but they're not. And that's why this is not a sound argument. Again, the structure of this argument is valid. If now, if both premises are true, then you have a sound argument. So Lincoln was smart enough to dissect out this argument and say, all right, I mean, this is how people convince you of things persuade you of things. They give you a deductive argument, A and B and therefore C. However, Lincoln said, that's not true. And hence, that's why I don't believe in your argument. Okay. So, those are uh, just to just to review. So, when you have a deductive argument, okay, it's the first thing you ask is whether it's valid or not, whether the structure is valid, and then you want to see if it's sound, meaning if the premises are true or not. Now, with an inductive argument, we don't, we don't use the words valid or sound. We talk about whether it's strong or weak. And then if it's strong, we say whether, you know, it's, it's um, uh, more likely, does, does it make sense? Uh, and I'll give examples of that. But the, those are the major differences between these two types of arguments. So, um, so let's um, give this example. So a, a woman has been found murdered. The husband is known to have threatened her repeatedly. The woman's husband murdered her. What's the conclusion here? What's that? Which one is the conclusion? Her husband is a murderer. Right, okay, good, very good. And the two premises are, a woman has been found murdered, the husband is known to have threatened her repeatedly. Is this a strong or weak argument? It's a weak argument. And why do you say that? 
because uh, not everyone who threatens you will murder you. Okay, all right, good, very good. So, um, by itself, that fact that the husband threatened her repeatedly barely supports the conclusion um, and, and supports it very, very slightly. Um, so, uh, so the premises of inductive arguments don't prove the conclusion, whereas before in deductive arguments, the premises do prove the conclusion, they could only support them. And they either support them strongly or weakly. So let's say if, um, uh, so, so actually what we'll talk about is that maybe, maybe not depending on the strength of the premises. Here's another example. Polls show that 75% of Republicans favor a school prayer amendment. Joe is a Republican, therefore Joe probably favors a school prayer because the premise here is only 75%. Now, if it was, so what do you think? If this was 100%. Strong argument. Well, not only a strong argument, mm -hmm. but it would be deductive. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if this is true and this is true, Therefore, Joe favors a school prayer. That would now be a deductive argument because the premises, um, the um, uh, because the premises proves absolutely the conclusion, um, and um, uh, whereas in a inductive argument. Okay, if the premises are not false, then this has to be true. So if we go back with 75%, if the premises are true, these premises are true, right? Let's say 75% favor a school prayer. Joe is a Republican. So then if you want to say this is deductive, you can't because this could be false. Even though these statements are true, this could be false. And that's why we say probably. And the best we could do is say this is an inductive argument, not a deductive argument. So again, in the deductive argument, if the premises are true, and in this case it's true, then the conclusion has to be true. But that's not the case. Because uh, unless, unless we say it's set uh, 100%, but we can't say that, and hence, it's only inductive. Okay, all right. So now, with our previous example of the husband, now if you say the husband fingerprints had been found on the murder weapon, that would be a stronger argument, right? as opposed to the husband was known to have threatened the wife. Now, if you... I'm again, sorry, Dr. Silverman? Yes. 
I'm sorry, can we go back to the last slide? I'm sorry, I just needed to make sure that I understood it. This, which slide? This slide? No, the one before that. I, yeah, this one. Yes. So if it, the 75%? No, no. The Republican. Oh, you want that slide? This slide? No, uh, yes, this one, yes, this one. Okay. So you're saying if it's 75%, it's going to be inductive and it's uh, has, a, it, it's inductive, but it doesn't, it, it's inductive and has a strong argument, right? But if it, it reaches... No, 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 no. What did you say? Inductive? Inductive. Yeah, we don't, we don't, uh, right. It's a... Uh, it's I just a got strong confused. argument. Yes. Because now, if this was twenty-five percent, then it would be a weak argument that okay. Joe favors a school prayer. Okay. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. So, if this was only twenty-five percent true, okay, this would be a weak argument. So just like, think of it this way. In this slide here, the fact that someone threatens her repeatedly, think of it as like 25% of Republicans favor a school prayer. Whereas now, in this example, where you're dealing with fingerprints, that's like saying 75% of Republicans. It, it becomes a stronger argument uh, that he murdered his wife. Whereas in the previous example, 75% is a stronger argument that Joe probably favors a school prayer. Again, if this was 25%, you wouldn't use the word probably, you would use the word maybe, as opposed to probably, okay? So this is where we evaluate the strength, we evaluate the strength of an inductive argument based on the premises, the you could call it the strength of the premises on how strong an inductive argument is. Now, again, let me repeat, if I had said 100%, then this would be a deductive argument because the premises are true and this has to be true. If this is only 75%, this, you can't say this has to be true because it's only 75%. And therefore, that's why you say probably. All right, just, just, um, just um, keep on thinking about this when we look at argumentation. So, um, so um, when we reason inductively, we try to support a conclusion. Inductive arguments are stronger or weaker depending on how much support the premise provides for the conclusion. That is, how likely the premise makes the conclusion or supports the conclusion. Um, we have, well, Golana, you're, you're the lawyer here, right? Have you used the term beyond a reasonable doubt? I guess you don't, 
you're not in the business of defending people. Yes. Or prosecuting yes. people. Yes. Uh, so in common law, the highest standard of proof is we say beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning if you have a reasonable doubt as to whether that uh, whether the husband killed his wife, you can't convict him. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? And, and that's why uh, the jury listens to the facts and they make a conclusion about the facts and they have to convict beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? And, you know, we have the prosecutor and the um, defense lawyer trying to um, argue guilt or innocence, and the jury is asked to return a verdict, and the judge will say, um, do you found guilty or not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, and that's, that's a pretty high standard because the legal system would rather have a hundred criminals go free in order not to convict one innocent person. And that's why we have such a, a high standard. So uh, let's, uh, so uh, just like in crimes and in, in doctoring, it's all inductive argumentation. So uh, I think, um, well, we've gone over hidden premises. Um, so knowledge check, okay? Stacy and Justin are on the brink of divorce. That's what this word says. Um, they're always fighting. So is that inductive or deductive? Uh, deductive. I think it's valid. Okay, tell me more. Why? It might lead to a divorce, but it's not for sure leading to a divorce. Like, so uh, you're calling it's not it a fact. Deductive or inductive? Deductive. 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 Inductive. 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 Right. So now. If, if you have an additional premise, every couple fighting is on the brink of divorce. So if you have one premise here and premise two, And then this is the conclusion. Now you have a deductive argument. Uh, that is, if this is true and this is true, then this has to be true. Yes. So that's a valid argument. However, it may not be sound because you don't know if the premises are true or not. Okay. Um, so, um, so again, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Now here, one could say, 
Well, this is not necessarily true. And then uh, one could say, well, this is not absolutely true. So actually, unless you know for sure these things are true, you can't deduce that they're on the brink of divorce. So without explanation, you could say you have at best uh, a strong inductive argumentation. So. So it's deductive. Uh, it's a. Uh, Oh, only if you could say um, it's deductive, um, you could say if, if you're saying this is true and this is true, okay, then is there any way you could say that conclusion could still be false. Well, I think the answer is you can. It would be deductive. Because if those two premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Yes. Okay. Uh, whereas yeah. before with the Republicans, you could only say it's deductive if it was 100% Republicans. Okay. Um, so that would be deductive. Uh, you can't, um, again, if these two statements are true, then this has to be true. Now, with the example with Lincoln, uh, if you accepted those two premises as being true, then the conclusion about slavery has to be true. But Lincoln said, hey, um, all right, uh, if your premises are true, you came up with a valid argument. However, guess what? The premises are not true. And hence, while you have a valid argument, it's not sound. Um, well, let me, I know this might be a little confusing, but let me, let me say that the good news is that most things in life are going to be inductive. <laughs> okay. Um, but we'll talk more about deductive arguments. But now sticking with inductive arguments, I want to, in order to help us evaluate the structure of inductive arguments, uh, sometimes it's good to diagram arguments. And let me show you what I mean. So here we have four statements. Which one is the conclusion? Four. Yes, or I mean, you, I mean, you could say all of these are claims, right? But when you look at it, we see that this conclusion depends on these premises, right? Okay, so we have premise one, two, and three, and then conclusion four, and and the way to 
diagram it is this way. We say we have premise one, premise two, premise three, and they all support that conclusion. So this is how we would um, uh, diagram that um, uh, that that argument just to vi visually show that uh, which which one are premises and which one are conclusions. Again, the the important thing is to determine which are the conclusions or the claims. What claim? is someone making and then you want to look at the premises and determine how strong or weak the premise is just like in that example with the husband and the wife okay so let's um so here's an example i don't think we should get carlos his own car as a matter of fact, he is not responsible because he doesn't care for his things. And anyway, we don't have enough money for a car since even now we have trouble making ends meet. Last week, you yourself complained about our financial situation and you never complain without a really good reason. Okay. You may have to read this again, but... How many conclusions or claims are made in this paragraph? Five. I'm sorry? Five. Five conclusions. Okay. I mean, again, you could say they're all conclusions, but, but some statements are supporting conclusions. So if, if a statement is supporting a conclusion, it's a premise for that conclusion. So your job is to find out which statements are conclusions such that the other statements are providing the evidence or providing the support. So there are some statements that do not provide a support for another statement. So think of it that way. So, like, as a matter of fact, he's not responsible because he doesn't care for his things, okay? Uh, and... Uh, so, uh, now, one could say, actually, one could say that this is a conclusion and this is a premise, right? And I would agree with that. Now, now does this whole statement, however, serve as a premise for another statement? Yeah. Which one? We should not get him his own car. Yes, right. So this is like further down the tracks. So this is a conclusion and it's supported by these two premises. 
thoughts? Any other conclusions? We don't have enough money. Right. That's right. That's a con now. That's a conclusion, and it's also a premise. A premise for the first one. Yes. Right. Good. So, what are the supporting premises for? We don't have enough money. We have trouble making all the following. Uh, uh, right. Yes. We. Uh, we don't have enough money for a car, and that's supported by we're having trouble making ends meet. And last week, you complained about our financial situation, and you never complained without a really good reason. So these are premises for this, okay? So, um, So now, if we want to number these statements here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, how would you draw that diagram? Well, we would, um, what are the two major conclusions here? One. Right. One. And four. Right. One and four. Okay. And we could say for one, this is a premise for this, and this is a premise for this, right? Yeah. And, and so I think, right, so I think, so I think we're going to have one, two, four, and then uh, three goes to, goes to two, and then uh, we have five, uh, and six, seven, and, and six, and and I guess uh, you could do it that way. So let's see. So we have three, two, oh, three. Oh, right. No, I'm sorry. I did that wrong before. Uh, so, right. Oh, 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 I, I, I see what they're doing. Uh, three. Uh, oh, okay. So that's why they're saying three, two, one. Right. That's the... Um, uh, right, yeah, this is a conclusion. I was going up the wrong tree. Uh, and then, and then we have, um, uh, six and seven, four, and then, and then five. What was five? Oh. And now we even have trouble making ends meet. Right, yeah, so five supports uh, four. Right, yeah, no, we had that right. So this is how you would diagram the conclusions. And they, these would be the supporting premises for each of those conclusions. And we said three supported two. Couldn't we link four to one? What's that? Four to one? Shouldn't we link four to one? Well. Four, uh, we don't have money. 
so we could not get his own car. Yeah, right. I I I agree with that. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, have, that makes sense. Right. Absolutely. Four is linked to one because that's that's the major conclusion of the whole paragraph. So four supports one. Right. Good. Great. Excellent. So, um, and um, uh, so in this slide, some claims, right, some claims may constitute reasons for more than one conclusion. Um, so, Carlos continues to be irresponsible. He certainly should not have his own car. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, he can forget about that trip to Hawaii this winter too, okay? Uh, so, uh, so some claims uh, could be reasons for more than one conclusion. So uh, this is one conclusion and this is another conclusion, and you could say it's all supported by not being responsible. So you could see how not being a responsible person could lead to a lot of, a lot of negative things. Okay, now we have one more thing. Um, when, when we think critically, Okay, one should actually think about counter arguments. Because if you don't think of counter arguments, you know, the person you're debating with will. And it's much better if you consider the counter arguments and see if you could still conclude the same thing, if that makes sense. You, you want to be always one step ahead of the game. So here we have an example. We really should have more African Americans on the faculty. That is why the new diversity program ought to be approved. True. It may involve an element of unfair, um, true, um, it, true, but I think there should be a word but here. But it may involve an element of unfairness to whites, but the benefits to society of having more black faculty outweigh the disadvantages. So what's the main conclusion in this argument? One. Okay, one. Uh, what are the supporting premises? Uh, well, no, let me take that back. Is one the major conclusion here? Four. Four is the major conclusion. Other thoughts? Two. Two? Yeah. I think, uh, I think two is the major conclusion. What are the supporting premises? I mean, the, these words gives it away. That is why. Therefore, hence, right? And the supporting premises are
Four. Four. Yeah, four. four. And what else? What do you think? One. Yes. What's that? I mean, we should have a diversity program. Why is that? Well, we should have more African Americans on the faculty. Now, this, I mean, for sure you could say that's a claim as well. But there's no other statements in that paragraph that supports that claim. It is better that this sentence supports this claim. And that's why we say statement one is a premise. Which one is the counter argument? Three. Three, right. That's the only one that's, that's left out, okay? So three introduces a consideration that runs counter to the conclusion, which is two, okay? Um, so how we diagram this is like this. We have, that's the conclusion, these are the premises, and this is the counter argument, okay? And, and you see how, how, how strong this statement is. This statement is even stronger because you consider the counter argument, and even with that counter argument, you still feel, um, um, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, you, you negated this counter argument by including four, okay? Uh, if, if you only had this, You could say, okay, all right, let's have a new diversity program. But now, since you considered this counter argument, you put in another premise to give even stronger support to your overall conclusion. That's why it's good to consider counter arguments. So, Let's, um, I sent you this exercise, right? Yes. On the email? All right. Yes. I want you to diagram this paragraph. That's been some, some good thinking. Um, so again, this is the major problem. And it says that the problem must be the distributor. That's the most distal thing here. Um, so, so actually, let me. Um, right, so distributor is the problem. There's no current. If there's no current, then either your alternator shot or your distributor is defective. Um, and um, so you have one at the bottom, okay. Now, there's no current at the spark plugs, but that supports that whole statement. Well, if there's no current at the spark plugs, then it's either the alternator or the distributor is defective. So actually, we have three there. Um, and, um, and then actually two 
justifies three. Two supports three. Right? Is that making sense? Um, you know it's either the alternator or the distributor because there's no current at the spark plug. And well, now we've gotten down to the issue, well, it's either the alternator or the distributor. All right, um, so, so how do we know it's not the alternator? With the light. Right, if the problem were in the alternator, then uh, let me call this five and six. So five plus six. Now you could um, do it either one or two ways. You could say, um, you could draw it like this, or you could draw it like this. Uh, well, I don't like that actually. Um, uh, because because all, all it is, what I'm trying to say is all of this justifies that. This combination, all those statements leads to one, but you were able to get the three only because you know about two. So again, all these three statements proves one. And two let you knew that it was either the alternator or the distributor. What do you think? So we know if there's no current at the plugs, then, so that's how we know this statement here, uh, I'm, this statement here, well, it's the same thing. If, well, this is, there's no current. Uh, well, we could call this two and then this whole thing is three. Um, it's worded a little ambiguous, but because there's no current at the spark plugs, that leads us to three. All right. Uh, how do I figure this out? Hmm. There's no current at the spark plugs, then it's either the alternator or the distributor. So now, how do we know it's not the alternator? Well, if it was the alternator, the dash warning light would be on, but the light isn't on. So all of these taken together proves one. All, all those are supporting premises for one. Does that follow logically, or what do you think? Yes. Okay. 
the one of the the hardest part is they're all conclusions. Uh, there's no current at the spark plug. That's a conclusion. But if a conclusion supports another statement, then it's a premise. Because there's no other statement there that supports the current at the spark plug. In real life, I'm sure somehow they determined there was no current at the spark plug. Uh, I, I used the meter and the meter was showing zero. In fact, I could, I could give you an exercise to give me premises for every conclusion, but guess what? It's for well, almost every premise I could ask you, what's the premise for that conclusion? It's, it's almost like dealing with a child. What does the child do? He or she keeps on saying, why, 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 right? Uh, for those who have children, it's endless. A child wants to know all the premises for all the conclusions. You know, so, oh, how do you know there's no current at the spark plugs? Well, there's nothing here that supports that statement. So um, you, you take that as a fact. You see what I'm trying to say is that when you have a paragraph with a bunch of statements, you have to figure out which are the ending conclusion, if that makes sense. All right, well, uh, now, um, so it's a little different here because um, uh, the, the problem added an additional statement here just to, just to clean it up. It's, it's, it's almost the same thing as three. So without trying to confuse, we have one and then we have five and six. And, you know, I had drew this as, as three and, and two leads to three. So it's a, it's a little different. I don't want to make it sound so crazy, but I think it's, it's better drawn this way. Two leads to three, and the combination of three, five, and six leads to one. So when, in your spare time tonight, think about that some more. Um, so let me end with this, um, I would, um, again, um, recommend, you know, I, I showed you where that textbook is. You know, you could, um, when you have time, just, I would recommend going to that textbook. So just to conclude, in evaluating arguments, first is the logic part. What do I mean by that? Um, well, it is, is the structure logical? Like, um, uh, like in deductive and inductive, uh, do you have, well, deductive, as I said before, if the premises are true, then the conclusion cannot be false. Okay, and and with um, the um, um, so is the deductive statement valid, or is the inductive statement relatively strong? Meaning, uh, again, think back to that example of why we think 
the husband killed the wife. Well, is it because they were arguing a lot or we found thing, his fingerprints on the gun? Okay. And, and so, um, and so, uh, so one is the logic part and then the other is the truth part, okay? Are the premises actually true or how true are they? So think about the Lincoln debate. Well, he said one of the premises wasn't true. And in the inductive part, well, how, how true um, are, is that premise in supporting the evidence that the husband killed the wife? So be suspicious of a premise that conflicts with our background information or other credible claims, um, as well as from a source that lacks credibility. And, and so when we're, now, when we dealt with the deductive argument, Clinton is taller than Bush, well, it's either yes or no, right? You measure it, you measure them, and you see who's taller. So. That's easy to find out whether it's true or false, okay? Uh, but in, in terms of inductive um, arguments, we have to use our base, baseline knowledge of the world. And just like a jury evaluating whether a person is guilty or not, they have to look at the evidence. In fact, when a judge, when the jury, in the beginning of a trial, the judge tells the jury, you're gonna hear the evidence and you're the arbiter of the evidence. <laughs> That's what the judge says. And it's the same thing in medicine. The healthcare provider gathers all the evidence and then comes to a conclusion about what the illness might be. And if there is strong symptoms, and strong signs leading to one illness, then uh, he or she most likely will be correct. But guess what? For those who take care of patients, if the patient tells you something not true about his or her symptom, guess what? What will happen with your conclusion? We cannot treat them properly. That's right. That's right. So be suspicious of a premise that conflicts with our background information. Or consider the, the credibility of the source. Okay. Um, so I remember one time I had two patients in the intensive care unit they both had pneumonia. One of them told me she had HIV. And, you know, she was a prostitute and blah, blah, blah. So we knew she had pneumocystis pneumonia. The other person was a married woman. And she said, and we asked her, does your husband have HIV? No. Do you have any extramarital affairs? No. Guess what? She did. And she had HIV. So for about a week, we treated her with the wrong antibiotic. So, uh, so actually, uh, Medicine is an inductive enterprise. 
Have you heard of Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Who is Sherlock Holmes? Uh, he's a detective. Right. And how did he solve the crimes? By, um, um, deduction. Deduction? Why do you say that? No, sorry, induction. Right, he gathered the evidence, right? Yes. And kind of like put two and two together. Who, who wrote the stories of Sherlock Holmes? Mm. It was a guy named Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was a writer, but before he was a writer, what was his profession? Detective? He was a doctor? <laughs> He was a doctor. A doctor, okay. And he knew all about inductive reasoning. And that's why he was able to write detective stories. And so we go through life mainly with inductive arguments. And so our next session will be trying to determine in a more formal way the strength and weaknesses of inductive arguments. How do we know, since most of life is all about inductive arguments, how do we know when someone is giving us a strong argument or a weak argument. And it's the same thing in writing conclusions in a research paper. How strongly does the data support your conclusions? And the same thing when we evaluate the ethical uh, aspects of a protocol, um, how, how well do we consider um, issues about privacy, confidentiality? What are our arguments for and against whether there are uh, invasion of privacies and all that stuff? So. Um, and, and I'll, I'll leave you with, again, one last example, what I said the other day. Many times people will just merely say, that's not ethical. Um, and, and that's a claim without any premises. And if the person says, well, we've always done it this way, that's a weak argument. Um, so uh, it's, it's um, you're building up your ability to refute weak arguments, but you have to learn um, what are examples of weak arguments, um, and, and, and hence, we'll also talk about logical fallacies. Okay. All right. Well, I think you surely did enough today to exercise your brain. Go back and either have dinner or have dinner again. No time for dinner. <laughs> Well, it's just, just time to you're, sleep. You're two and a half hours ahead of everybody else. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Okay. I All have right, another great. meeting at nine. Okay. <laughs> I have another meeting you at have nine. meeting? Yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. At the sporting <laughs> club? <laughs> All right.
All right, guys. Thanks for your attention. Have a good rest of the evening. Have a good day or tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Have a nice weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.